So my name is Kristen Rotz and I am the Executive Director of Pennsylvania 211 and the President of United Way of Pennsylvania. And as I think you know, we are here today on PA 211 Day to celebrate what uh, 211 brings to our communities across the state. And today we have a panel of people who have a lot of experience in helping to make our communities stronger. We have a group of people who are collaborators. We have a group of people who consist of service providers and also elected officials. We have elected officials with a good track record of putting their community at the front of their efforts and really working in a bipartisan way as they do that. Um, we think they are a great representation of everything that we should strive for in a partnership between our elected officials and the community. So I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists and I'm going to go through some individual introductions for you here this morning. So to start off with, um, I'd like to introduce Joe Arthur, who's a familiar face to many of you here in the Central Pennsylvania region. Joe is the executive director of the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank. He's been there um, since 2012 in that role. And prior to that, he worked for about 23 years in the finance and accounting management sector, working also with Pennsylvania Community Food Banks. Um, Joe is an advocate. He's an advocate at the local level. He also takes some of his time to contribute to statewide policy discussions, uh, which is something that's very valuable. I can hear it this way. I couldn't hear it through my speakers. We have someone who's not muted. Please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, so this is Joe and welcome Joe. Thanks for being with us here today. Next up, I'm gonna introduce Representative Brian Cutler, also from Lancaster County. Um, he serves currently as the Speaker of the House, which is the highest leadership position in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, and he is serving his eighth term. Representative Cutler has a really interesting background um, and has really spent his life working his way through various levels of education, um, various levels of responsibility in the healthcare sector before he decided to run for office um, and has really been, I think, a good champion in the legislature of trying to work together in a bipartisan manner, but also stepping out and looking at holistically what it is that takes to build around a person in the community to help them be successful and move towards self-sufficiency. So we are glad to have Representative Cutler here today and wanna to thank him for joining. Next up, I'm gonna introduce Ismael smith Whitell. Um, he is currently the president of the city council in Lancaster, um, but he's also got a lot of interesting career experience that overlaps well with 211. He has worked with the Mayor's Commission to Combat Poverty and with the Community Action Partnership. And he's been involved in several housing initiatives in Lancaster County. So I look forward to all the perspective that he can bring from those professional roles today. Uh, I did kind of skip, I was gonna go alphabetically, but I'm jumping around a little bit here. Let me go back to Janet Diaz. Um, Janet is here with us. She is also currently serving on the Lancaster City Council and she has had a long history of involvement in her community. She is um, very committed to working with different partnerships that also center around healthcare. Um, and she's been involved not only as an elected official and a professional, but in a number of volunteer capacities in the community. So welcome, Janet. Next up, I'll talk about uh, Senator Schwank. Judy Schwank is here with us today. Um, Senator Schwank serves a legislative district which represents Reading and many of its surrounding boroughs and townships. I got to know Judy when she was a county commissioner. Um, I used to work for the County Commissioners Association and Judy was a commissioner and a committee lead um, who I worked with there. And I never realized, Judy, that you were the first woman that was elected to the role of county commissioner in Berks County. Um, but Reflecting back, we can see that while we're making steps towards equity every day, that evolution in our history has continued to be very recent. Um, so Judy's also a great champion of many of the issues that United Way cares about, including investments in high quality early childhood services. And Judy also serves as a member of the United Way of Pennsylvania board. And then also, I want to loop back to Representative Culver. Linda Culver is here. 
Her legislative district serves a few counties in the uh, Susquehanna Valley region. She has been serving in the legislature since 2010. Um, her district includes parts of Northumberland County, the Sunbury area, um, and some rural parts of other communities up in that area of the state. Um, Linda is also a member of the United Way of Pennsylvania Board. Linda and I have worked together a lot on the issue of 211 and also on many of our early childhood priorities. Linda is a great voice in her caucus. She's emerged as um, a leader within that group and also someone who I think does a really great job working across all segments of her caucus to try to advance the issues that she believes are important. So we're glad to have Linda here today and have her serving on our board of the United Way of Pennsylvania. So without any further ado, um, we're gonna jump into our questions today. And the first question that I wanna ask everybody to talk about is from your professional experience, you all have some role in trying to help people in your community connect to resources that they need. And so can you tell us a little bit about what the challenges are that you have faced as either elected officials or service delivery organizations? And I wonder if, I'd like to make sure we get a local perspective, local elected official perspective, state elected official perspective, um, and then service delivery. So um, would either of our local elected officials like to lead off with some perspective there? Councilor Diaz, please. <laughs> I would say that um, not only working as, not working, working also as locally with uh, Lancaster City Council, we do find where mental health um, resources are, are a very high priority right now. Many have asked and reached out uh, to me to see where um, I would be able to find locations where they can go. Um, that is a very big issue. Um, that mostly in the homeless population in Lancaster is where I see that uh, many wind up incarcerated because they are either agitated, they're men you know, mentally um, unstable. And I think that's where I find a roadblock sometimes. Although working in Lancaster General Health, um, we do have the ability to find and we ask those questions so we can continue finding ways to help, whether it's um, you know, food resources, um, medical um, attention that they would need or financial strains um, that they run into. So those are some of the qualities and things that we look for when patients come into Lancaster General and also as your local legislator to help them. Thank you. Representative Culver or Cutler or Senator Schwank, do you have anything from your perspective trying to provide constituent services to your- um, I'll take it if that's okay. Yeah. So from my perspective, I mean, and prior to running for office, I had worked for uh, the sitting member for 21 years. So I was doing the constituent service. And uh, one of my favorite things is when somebody comes to me with a new challenge, um, because I know if I can find that resource, then I can use it again for somebody else or share it with other people. So I find a lot of times when people get to us, we're either the first stop, and so they haven't done any homework. And I find for many reasons, it's they don't have the confidence to do it. They don't know how to do it. They're either undereducated and can't figure out how to, to maneuver the system or make that first call, or oftentimes they're illiterate and nobody wants to confess to being illiterate. Um, so I always tell my staff, if somebody says I didn't bring my glasses today or my pen's not working or whatever, just do it, fill out the form, don't ask any questions because uh, oftentimes they are illiterate and nobody wants to say that they are. Or we are the last stop because they've hit roadblock after roadblock after roadblock and then they're angry and frustrated. So in order for us to help them, we have to bring them down from the angry and frustrated um, and get them to be able to talk openly about what they're doing. Uh, the other roadblock I find oftentimes is communication. People don't know how to communicate what it is they actually need. So we have to learn how to ask the right questions to get them to tell us that. 
Um, so we are helping them appropriately. We're not wasting any more time because um, when they get to their elected officials, um, usually we are in crisis mode and we have to figure out quickly how to get through that, which is why we rely on so many resources in our community, like 211, United Way, or we go out and try and find our own resource. Um, but locally, we try and go back and reach out and share that resource uh, if we found something that isn't known otherwise. So I don't know if there's roadblocks as much as finding resources, um, but bridging that gap between getting people from where they're at the stage they're in to the resources. And that I'll, usually I'll requires, go ahead, go ahead. I'll just jump in. I, Representative Culver did a great job of explaining, you know, how we interact in our legislative offices. I often say, uh, Quite frankly, we're a social service agency in many ways on the local level. And we pride ourselves on knowing where all the resources are, but we find in many cases, there are big holes in the social safety net. There are you know, places, for example, um, single women um, have a very hard time finding shelter. If you have children um, or you're a single male, there's plenty of, you know, there or at least enough sufficient resources or places that we can refer people to. So in many cases, you know, here's where 211 really steps up to help us is um, helping us find resources for those requests where we don't always have all the answers. And I think the other thing too is that, and I, I, I believe Representative Culver addressed this as well, people have more than one need. It may be you know, the first thing they come in about is housing, but there are so many other issues. It could be childcare, certainly food, um, uh, access to food, it may be paying their utilities if it's a, you know, an issue with a landlord or something. So they're, you know, they're, they're complex issues many times and we kind of have to peel back the layers to get at what people really need. And 211 has been very helpful to us. Well, along those lines, uh, Chris, and I think it's also important to know, I think oftentimes our legislative offices, as a senator and representative both pointed out, end up being more like air traffic control. You know, these individuals come in, they don't exactly know what services they might be eligible for or need. And that's really uh, where we start working through it. And sometimes, um, you know, what they originally come in for is actually a symptom to something else. Um, it's not the actual issue. Uh, at hand. And I know sometimes we see that in the Medicaid population. Um, you know, I know that Lancaster General did a great job with their super user program. And it turned out that some of the people coming to the hospital were coming to the hospital for, uh, you know, social reasons. You know, they didn't have food at home or they didn't have access to mental health services. And that's, I really think, where 211 is very helpful because for us, it's, it ends up being a one stop shop. And and many times, you know, the, the individuals who come to the office may not even know that, you know, the reasons uh, or, the, or necessarily the, the, the actual uh, services that might be available that we can help them with. And I, I think that's where 211 really shines because you can say, okay, you know, what are you dealing with? You're dealing with a, you know, a, a homelessness issue or you're dealing with access to certain services. Okay, well, we're going to get you here. And then sometimes while you have them you're navigating them through that part, you find out that there's a couple other things that they also could benefit from. And I, I think that's a huge, huge value to add for all of our constituents. Joe, you've got a big footprint for a good portion of Pennsylvania. So you have a really broad perspective on this. Is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah, just probably um, just sort of additive to uh, what our representatives, public officials have said. Um, and we do hear I apologize, my, my uh, automatic lights went off here. Um, so I, I look a little dark at the moment, but I'm still here. Um, so we hear a lot from, from our legislative offices in our, in our footprint, which is mostly rural, actually, the Susquehanna Valley. And um, I, I just would like to say 211 is vital to you know, everybody um, throughout the 27 counties we serve, but it's particularly important in our rural areas where we do have um, no, no news to our public officials, but uh, we do have broadband issues. We have internet issues. So it may not be an option or a very good option for folks to uh, use the internet and go through, uh, get to our website or, or our fellow um, 
uh, partner organizations that we work with, um, it just may not be an option. Two on one is the option that works. Uh, the two on one staff are incredible navigators. Um, of course, we come in uh, on the food assistance needs, um, but we have some experience with running our own helpline and we have some idea of what that takes. Uh, and we simply just need the resources there for those navigators. Uh, and unfortunately, it, you know, our public officials in their offices are doing some of this work, which, which uh, you know, uh, I think is putting a, a burden on onto those offices that's better held in the human services field. So, uh, to me, the two one one navigators are the, uh, and their systems are really the place to be doing a lot of that. Um, so that that would be our perspective. Thanks, Joe. I'd like to move on to the next question and Ismail, I'll give you the chance to lead off. Um, but I think there's, you know, there's interesting things playing out in our public discussions where we can all recognize the people like Alice in our community who are working and they're still struggling to make ends meet. And I think generally every Pennsylvanian recognizes that as their neighbors and their friends and family members. But then we also have a pretty significant dialogue about, you know, there are people who need help and everybody else doesn't need help. And what is the value of investing in people who need help? But I think those two issues are not necessarily something that we should so exclusively isolate from each other because there is an impact on the overall um, health and vibrancy of a community that is linked to how all in our communities are doing. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about um, some examples of how you see this play out in the work that you're doing in each of your organizations. Yeah, Kristen, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, and thank you to everybody else who's on the call, who's doing, uh, who's doing this really critical work today. You know, so I work directly in, in the human services field in addition to my elected role. And we see folks coming out of the hospital who come out of the prison, um, who come directly to the Lancaster County Homelessness Coalition for services. And how they're treated in the system is indicative of how really everyone is treated in the system. I think it's a basic Lancaster County value. We all agree that how we treat the least of us, that that should be in line with how we all how we all deserve to be to be treated. You know, uh, unfortunately, we had a gentleman um, who was staying uh, staying in hotel, um, and LGH had paid for him to stay in hotel. He had been released from Lancaster County Prison, um, and he he passed away. Uh, you know, he was he was unwell, but we could see in that gentleman. His name was John. He was uh, aging, you know, he was a senior. He had medical health needs, he had housing needs. Connecting those things, uh, I think we have to be really specific about this. Connecting those things throughout our system saves lives. Where we can reach folks who may have, be having an issue with their landlord or who may be having an issue accessing food services, we can jump in early on. And thanks to connective, you know, 211 and, you know, Empower Lancaster case, Caseworthy, these serve as the connective tissue in a body of legislators and social services across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so we can say to folks, if you have a need, we can connect you somewhere where we meet all of those needs. The thing that 211 levels up, and I want to make sure that we, um, we talk about this on 2 one day and, and give the United Way uh, its propers is that, you know, as Joe pointed out, often legislative offices end up providing direct services to individuals. And I think we're all okay with that. The job that's sort of written on the tin is organizing our society and our laws uh, to make the human services better, to give everybody you know, the life they deserve and the opportunity they can have in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Organizations like 211 help us not only serve people directly, but they provide crucial data and information 
Why are people calling in what region? What's happening? So that we can, you know, sort of catch the football, if you will, and then observe and make the changes that are needed. And so it, it really is working across that spectrum that lets us deliver for the people that we're supposed to deliver for, whether it's in the human services position or because they're one of our constituents. Any other comments on this question of how supporting people in our community who need help impact the overall quality of life in our communities? I'll, I'll comment a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes um, when we tell people to call two on one, uh, they find a resource that they actually needed. Um, and they will say, you just call this 211. My fear is they're telling them to call it for everything under the sun um, after they come here because we usually, you know, people are reluctant 211. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? There's no number like that. I'm not calling them. I don't have an emergency. It's, it's not like that. You know, we try to explain it out, but we've heard people come in here and say, so and so, my neighbor, because, you know, a lot of times people live in the same neighborhood that have needs, told me to call this 211. I think she, there's something wrong with her. I've never heard of this. So they'll come back to us to ask the question, is this really, can I, can I call there? Um, so I find that interesting. But even sometimes after they talk to 211 and find out what their resources are, they will come back into my office and ask us to call the numbers or contact those resources on their behalf, which goes back to, I think sometimes they don't have the confidence. Um, they don't have the wherewithal, or sometimes I think it's a matter of uh, being illiterate, or we do sometimes, I didn't mention there's a hearing issue. So they think they got everything that they were told, but they're not always positive. Um, we did find when we are sending people to 211, we find sometimes they come back to us and say they couldn't get help. We find that maybe we should screen them just a little bit more um, before we send because they are over income or they are, you know what I mean? So we're trying to alleviate that so people aren't running around saying I couldn't get help. We were realizing, oh, well, maybe we should have screened them a little bit more to realize maybe they're not eligible for that type of help or maybe we need to send them somewhere else. So um, I think though, once you help somebody uh, in a community, and I don't know if anybody's been through the poverty study, um, people that do not have a lot of money don't have a lot of things, but they collect people um, and they help people. So. I think once they find out about a resource, they start sharing that within their community and helping them um, along the way. So I think that's what's really important about 211. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. I think it highlights that the, the ability to have a person-to-person -person contact is important. And we have a couple of projects where we're doing some more focused navigation and extended um, contact with people. And I think that's the beauty of 211 is we have this foundational platform that you call and you get help, but it can scale to be more than that. And all it takes is the resourcing to make sure that work can be done. And we see that with a lot of focus in the social determinants of health space, which I think nearly everyone here has already touched upon. The fact that um, how your basic needs are met has the direct impact on your health outcomes and how you're utilizing the healthcare system, which has an impact on all ratepayers and taxpayers. Um, we want people to seek the seek the right care at the right time in the right place. Um, so we call it hand holding here in my office. Yeah. Some people need their hand held a little bit longer than others. Um, yep. And we're going to do what it takes. So yep. thanks for that. Any other comments? One thing I'd I'd like to add, um, Kristen, is in terms of legislative offices, um, what we we find certainly many times people come in to complain about something right or something's wrong or something needs to be fixed and that's it, it's a point of entry and i think the more points of entry that we can give to people in our community to get you know the array of services that they need to help them get better lives i think the better here's one good example is the property tax and rent rebate um, program, which is available primarily to seniors, but also, you know, people of low income or widows, you know, it, there's, there's some qualifications to that. 
It's a big factor in my legislative office. It's almost like a social event. People come in to, you know, get their, their form filled out. They talk to the staff. They know us. And it, it just, it's, we enjoy it. Now, of course, this is pre-COVID more than it is right now, but we're coming out of that now. But the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes we discover something else that, you know, in the conversation, my staff are very good at doing that and then making, you know, possibly the referrals that we need. The longer I've been a legislator, the more I understand how you, 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 you really have to have an array when they talk of services and you talk about wraparound services. So kudos to you know, all of the folks on this call um, who are listening and, and my fellow panelists that actually do the work because that, that's what is important. People need more than one particular thing more often than not. And that's what can make the difference in their lives and then in our communities which I think was part of what you were getting at, that we absolutely have to work our hardest to make sure that everybody can, can rise above and can fulfill their, their life potential. Thank you. So I'm gonna move on to the next question. And several of you have already touched on ways that you, that you use 211. If there are things you haven't already mentioned and you'd like to feel free. Um, we'll, we'll spend some time on this question and I'll give everybody a chance to weigh in on this. Um, but the other thing is, you know, we're constantly looking to improve at 211 and build our relevancy in the community. Um, and we're interested in what you see as opportunities where 211 can level up. Um, and then, you know, any perspective you have on what you think our various partners need to do to help us get there. So, um, let me start. Joe, would you mind leading off on this one? Sure, Kristen. Uh, thank you. But, you know, my, my view on this is 211 works, right? So we're always looking for solutions that, that work for, you know, our Pennsylvanians in need, our neighbors. And the human element is so important. Systems are important, um, but those, uh, I'll get back to the navigators. Um, the, the skill and the access to information that they have. I mean, um, navigating any of, the, any of these systems, whether it's you know, a state agency system, whatever it is, federal agency system. I mean, these, these systems are challenging for anybody. Um, we do a lot of uh, applications uh, through our helpline team for, for SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance, right? I, I will say, this is no, you know, this is not a stretch. Um, many of our tax returns are easier than the SNAP application. It is just that complex. So our team will do that online through the Compass system. But they can only do that if people know how to get to them. So 211 is, is um, one of two or three primary referral sources for our food bank and um, the hundreds of partner agencies that we work with. But 211 is right at the top, as is Google, right, as you might imagine, uh, through the web. But 211, that, that is actually thousands of calls per month coming to our network, either our partner agencies on the ground, some of whom are on the call uh, today, uh, or uh, right to our team here at the food bank, thousands of calls per month. Because when someone has an issue, they, you know, whether it's housing, whatever, they usually have a need for food as well, right? Um, but without 211 helping to um, pipeline those calls to us, we're probably not going to be able to help that individual get those SNAP benefits or get the need, the, uh, um, the services that they need. So, um, you know, I just, uh, there are a lot of solutions that are always talked about, but when, when you have one that works, invest in it, enhance it, expand it is so much easier than building from scratch systems that take years to bring online. So I'm, I know I'm probably going a little bit strong here, but to me, invest in the system that works and enhance that. That's it. Kristen, if I may. Go ahead. Um, I just want to go off of what, uh, what Mr. Arthur said. Uh, there is a woman who is a constituent of ours in Lancaster City. Uh, she's a single mother of four children and she works two jobs. And in talking with her, if you listen to her story, and she's just a really fantastic person, but you'll hear that she has 
housing needs, she has food needs, you know, she might need some help filing a tax return or, or even applying for emergency rental assistance or SNAP. And a thing that keeps coming up is that she doesn't have the time to hunt down all the various agencies. How is she supposed to wake up in the morning, get her kids off to school, go to one job, come home, feed her kids dinner, go to her other job, come home, tuck her kids into bed, and then chase down this application and that application and actually have time to finish them. The, the navigation role, directing people to the various services, helping them get those applications and eligibilities completed could not be more crucial. And I've always believed that if you actually think a service works, uh, just as Joe said, you have to invest in it. 211 can level up by making sure that there are as many navigators and staff people pardon me, meeting the challenges of our residents um, as is possible because we have thousands of residents across the Commonwealth uh, with needs that, that stack on top of each other. And so I think we have an obligation uh, locally, statewide, I probably shouldn't recommend a specific policy, but I think we can all agree that increasing the funding for 211 and letting them increase the number of personnel responding to our constituents' needs is I mean, I think it's the obvious step and maybe the only one. Linda, you've been helping us work on that issue in the General Assembly. Um, do you wanna to talk to what you think the value is or the challenges are for those of us who sit back and look and say, we feel like we have a good platform here that state government should invest in more in. How do we get there? I've always said, I mean, so first, I apologize to anybody who works for 211, because when a legislator calls you, you have to know, uh-oh, this is not going to be an easy question, because we know a lot of resources. So, um, I mean, our staffs call 211 themselves. You know, we pass that number out. Um, locally on the ground, it's a great resource to get people connected, um, like been, which has been said previously, you know, with the food bank, with the services they need, people who don't have time, who are working uh, multiple jobs. But from a legislator's perspective, sometimes to really hit home the value of it, not that it just helps people because they might say, well, maybe there's somebody else who could help them, or maybe, you know, they'll come up with other reasons. I think it's the data um, is a huge selling point. I don't, I don't want to sell short how much you're doing on the ground in our communities, because I think that's extremely important. Um, but the data coming where uh, we may think, oh, this money should be going here because that's so important. But maybe that's what's just hitting the media because somebody grabbed the ear of uh, the media or maybe somebody got on Facebook, had a great story, but it was only a very small group of people. Um, maybe the bigger need is, you know, Joe getting 5,000 calls saying, you know, we have food and he sees it, an extreme increase all of a sudden uh, or an extreme increase for mental health services as we've seen through COVID. Um, you may think it's correct and you may think you're on point, but two and one has a way of being able to show us. Um, yeah, you are absolutely on point. You need to get more money here. Or you need to get more personnel here. Or we, we need to do more in this area. Or you may say, hey, we've perfected or corrected or that need is not as strong anymore. And it helps us shift money almost real time. I mean, not that our money gets shifted exactly real time, but um, for the next budget cycle. Um, I think that is the greater importance as we are making decisions, um, not just the, the great things you're doing at home, but how we can respond to issues we know are proven to be a need um, or how we're failing miserably at not meeting a need. Um, I think that's what's really important for us. And that's the selling point I have been using. Um, this could go a long way for us, either A, saving money, be reallocating it to where it really, really needs to be um, and will help us make decisions. Do we need to raise taxes? Do we not need to raise taxes? Uh, what programs need more investing? So that's my favorite part about 211 is it's like this, when we talked about wraparound services, Senator Schwank, um, what a great way to do that appropriately. Kristen, if I may. Go ahead. Um, I just want to commend Linda. She's such a wonderful advocate for 211 in the House, and she does a wonderful job 
not just representing our area, but really the needs all across our region. And uh, I, I agree with her. And I think from our standpoint, as we advocate in the chambers, it is the data that helps convince individuals uh, about the value of that investment. Uh, so th that is, um, and I realize that it's a double-edged sword because it actually, you know, the, the time you spend collecting data is time that you're actually not helping someone else uh, who might need access to something. But that data is immensely important because it will be what allows us to focus. Uh, I think looking forward, I think one of the, the greatest uh, integrations is yet to come, and that's with the 988 line. Uh, I think as we bring that in into this um, and continue to help address uh, some of the, the mental health issues that we have, and unfortunately, we've seen an increase with them uh, during uh, the, the COVID pandemic, that will continue to be those wraparound services uh, because sometimes, you know, housing instability, food insecurity, you know, it could be that's a symptom of a underlying mental health condition. And that just happens to be what we see or what 211 hears when individuals call in. So being able to help direct them to those resources in addition to physical resources, uh, I, I just think it's going to be great as we continue down that road and as it becomes more widely implemented across the country. Uh, so that's one thing I'm looking forward to, but it also highlights the need uh, for further investment. And I, I, I want to put a plug in for all of the providers as well. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that we as elected officials end up dealing with is a wide variety of issues. Uh, so while Linda and I and Senator Schwank might have some personal interactions with 211 or the staff there or constituent stories to share, not everybody has that same level of connection. So it's important for all of the advocates that are that are here in this call to reach out to their state senator, reach out to their state representative, and just share what that means. Uh, because we all have different backgrounds, we all have different areas of expertise. But the advocacy that I think is always the best, you know, is actually, and it's even better than the data that I referenced in, in the open, are those personalized stories where individuals can call in and say, I needed access to housing. I called 211 and this is what happened. And they, they kind of lay out the roadmap, the good and the bad. Like I hit a hurdle over here, but we were able to overcome it or it worked wonderfully and everything worked out exactly the way it should. Uh, those kinds of personal stories are great. And to the extent that individuals are willing to share them, I think they're very powerful. And then you layer those personal stories on with the data. And uh, I think the possibilities are endless. I'm going to launch off of that, um, Speaker Cutler and um, Representative Culver. Excellent points. And I'll note that we just had our um, budget address this week, right? The governor um, laid out his budget for 2022-23. 211 is flat funded. And the resources that are there are, you know, are, I don't think, significant enough to address all that 211 does for us. So now it's timely. And it's timely, um, again, for the providers that are out there to speak to your representatives and senators and tell them, you know, you have an opportunity now as we go through budget hearings to, you know, at the hearing for, for the Department of Health and Human Services, talk about, you know, this allocation and how 211 is helping in your community. The selling point for me in terms of 211 with my colleagues um, in my caucus is one, you can go to the website, the 211 website, you can break down the data by your, your district. You can, whether you're a congressperson or whether you're a state rep or senator, you can break it down by zip code. And it's not, you know, it's not just census data, you know, which is always seems to me to be so far behind where we actually are. What's on there right now is actually up to date to like February 2021. It's incredible. So I looked at my data just for my district. I could have looked for the whole county, right? But, and I think I would have seen the same thing. The biggest issues were housing and rent assistance, housing availability. And I know, you know, well, COVID is a big part of this, but even before this, this was an issue in my community. It gives me a sense of what I've got to work on 
in terms of working with my local partners, um, Joe and others, you know, in the legislature as to what we've got to do to improve, um, you know, the, the situation in, in, in our county. And finally, I would say one of the things that I, I see is becoming available is accessing 211 by text. In my past history, I was a uh, college uh, dean, and I can remember I would send emails to students and I would never hear from them. I would try to call them, never call me back. But if you send a text and say, you know, you're failing, you better get in my office and talk to me, that reached people. This is the way people communicate. So, you know, I commend 211 for being able to, to do that, to, to multiple ways to interact and access the system. The senior who, who wants help probably wants to talk to somebody. Somebody else may want to start with a text. So these are the selling points that we need to tell our legislators because it's this is the time, folks. We've really, this is our chance to make that difference in the budget. Thanks, Judy. And Janet, I see you, you want to weigh in. I want to wrap up a couple points here. I'm actually getting some questions in the chat and people are asking me, what is PA 201 currently getting for state funding? Right now, we have a $750,000 appropriation in the state budget. Overall, our local community partners are putting in well over $3 million to support the system. And we'd like to get to closer to a, we see ourselves as a three-legged stool. We need to have local funding and support. We need to have state funding and support. And then we need to have fee-for-service contracts. And we've been growing in the fee-for-service contract area. There has been more local investment, particularly over the pandemic, but we do want, I think we want to encourage our state government partners to step up. So this is the time, as Senator Schwank has said, it is budget advocacy season. Um, and we think that the, the needs of 201 align well with even some of the one-time federal resources that are sitting in our state's coffers and waiting for uh, good plans to invest them in. We have some needs at 211 that fit well, and certainly we are seeing the increased demand at 211 as a result of the pandemic. Janet, go ahead. I just wanted to weigh in, especially with my personal background. Um, and coming to Lancaster and being homeless myself, um, having to live at a U-Haul truck because we couldn't find any housing. And it took us a few months before we could actually have any type of help, which it was great that they have um, nonprofit organizations. Um, but at the time, if we would have had um, 211, we, it wouldn't have to have been such a long extended time for us. Um, you know, living in poverty myself, it, it was a big struggle, especially for my mother, um, not understanding the system in Pennsylvania versus the systems in New York City, where things there were completely different. We didn't have to have any type of reference to get um, a place to live. Where we came here, we had cash, and there you can just pay in cash and be able to get a place. So using nine, um, using 211, many times I call Kevin Ressler, hey, I have this situation. Can you give me a direction to help my community members, especially some of the elderly, um, whether it's food resources or, um, like you said, we are having issues with having affordable and a sustainable home, you know, homes for our community that live on minimum wage. So it's really important for us to, as legislator and also Pennsylvania um, legislators to make sure we have more funding uh, for uh, you, the United Way so we can continue working with them and helping our community. Thanks, Janet. We have just a little over 10 minutes left. And so we're gonna get to one more question here. Um, and I, we're gonna zoom out a little bit. It's less two on one specific, but most of our participants today are from the nonprofit sector. And uh, generally, you know, nonprofit partners, some of them are eager and willing to do advocacy. Some are less eager to do advocacy. Um, but we believe strongly as United Way that there is a way to do advocacy in a bipartisan manner and to adhere to what you need to make sure you're doing appropriately as a 501c3. You all, as many of you as elected officials, hear from a lot of different interests, um, but we as nonprofits often represent voices who don't have a direct line to your ear or have a lot of people lobbying on their behalf. So 
I would love for each of you to give your thoughts on tips or pointers for those of us in the nonprofit sector who are current advocates or want to get more involved in advocacy on behalf of the people we serve. 